so good afternoon everyone so welcome to the eighth lecture on high pressure physics and second lecture on experimental measurements in last two lecture first in the uh, first lecture we uh, learned how we can generate high pressure for various kind of experiments and in the last lecture uh, we studied basically we learned how we can use x ray diffraction for investigation of material under high pressure and uh, typically we use is a diamond diamond cell in this lecture what we are going to uh, learn is basically uh, two more x ray based technique that is one is the x ray absorption technique and x ray raman scattering and then uh, in the last we will see a uh, neutron diffraction uh, in the context of high pressure measurements so let's uh, here is the outline of uh, today's uh, presentation first we will start with the x-ray absorption spectroscopy what are the basic of x-ray absorption and x-ray emission then uh, we'll see what are the detailed part of the x-ray absorption like x-ray absorption near edge structure extended x-ray absorption fine structure and then uh, we'll see that uh, synchrotron uh, is a must for such kind of uh, experiment so we will uh, uh, try to uh, learn what are the various techniques that can be used to do x-ray uh, x-ray absorption spectroscopy one is the dispersive access then we'll go for the scanning access and uh, uh, we'll discuss uh, current development on a continuous scanning x xs at indus then we will uh, discuss what are the uh, limitation challenges that we have to face when we do high pressure x-ray absorption spectroscopy and then a small part on the analysis of x-ray absorption data next comes to the x-ray uh, raman scattering or non-resonant x-ray inelastic scattering then what, how it is different from uh, uh, normal Raman scattering or uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy? What kind of experimental setup uh, can be used to do X-ray Raman scattering measurement? And what is the relevance for the high pressure measurement? And in the last, we will see uh, the neutron scattering technique for studying the material under high pressure. We we'll start with some basics. Then, what are the various possible neutron source, and then uh, we'll see the how we can employ this for the high pressure uh, diffraction measurement. So, let's start from a basic. Let's say we have a one isolated atom. So, this atom will have uh, various energy levels. We start with the K is L or M is, and then continuum. What happens when uh, an incident X-ray or comes or incident photon comes? Uh, if its energy is sufficient so that it can knock out the, if it can knock out the uh, core hole to a continuum, then there is a vacancy is created. So this vacancy can be filled by the another uh, electron in the uh, higher cell, which which leads to emission of a photon and that is known as a fluorescence photon and there is also possibility that uh, another electron is uh, ejected this is known as Auger electron and if this this uh, electron which is coming from core electron depending upon the incident energy it can have a zero energy or some finite kinetic energy we can employ this technique to study the uh, material that we will come so as we know that x-ray absorption or x-ray fluorescence uh, is element specific means these energy levels uh, are basically for uh, individual atom they are fixed so they this can be used for fingerprinting the elements in your system uh, through uh, fluorescence or uh, absorption but uh, when we do the x-ray absorption 
we can get some more information. So when you are doing X-ray absorption of an isolated atom, and how you do is basically you uh, see the ab absorbance of uh, these X-rays with energy, you do the energy, and what happens is when you keep on increasing, the initially the transmission is more, there is less absorption. When your incident photon energy is sufficient that uh, it can uh, increase the core electron energy to the continuum, then you start seeing the absorption that is known as absorption is and uh, if you further increase the energy then it will be a sort of continuous uh, variation in the absorption uh, coefficient when this is the case for the isolated atom. What happens if uh, this, mat uh, this atom is inside a condensed matter phase? So you have a nearby atom so if you see the potential you will have a, some nearby atom. And when, it, when you do similar kind of measure and me measurement, you see the transmission and then suddenly you will see uh, there is an absorption, but this absorption has some feature. Why this feature is coming is basically when you are supplying the energy to uh, uh, electron and it, its energy is higher than the uh, energy required to reach it to the continuum, then it, it will be in the form of kinetic energy. And uh, from the wave particle duality, we know that uh, this uh, electron will also, uh, act as a, uh, can be considered as a wave, and this wave pro propagates uh, outward. Then uh, this wave is scattered with the nearby atom. This is scattering, because of scattering, the, uh, there will be a two waves. One is outgoing, another one is incoming and whenever there is an interference between these uh, so these two will interfere and based on the interference condition you will get higher absorption or lower absorption and that leads to the oscillation in the absorption coefficient now you you take an example where uh, you have an isolated atom this is a typical absorption spectra for a krypton gas, if it is in the uh, atomic form, then you can see it's a continuous varying function. But if, if it is a, in the form of diatomic uh, gas, then you can clearly see there will be oscillations. How you can perform this measurement is basically you have an incident beam and then you put a sample and there, is, there will be a transmitting beam. So you measure both these, uh, these beams and this, this will follow a Beer's law, Beer Lambert's law and based on this one, one can determine what will be the absorption co coefficient. This is the basically uh, absorption coefficient of some of the uh, elements in a low, in, uh, low energy resolution. You can see that there will be absorption, then next element comes and then next and so and so. Now, uh, if we see the detail of this X-ray absorption spectra, this, uh, uh, th this spectra uh, range about 1000 EV or so. So we can uh, divide this spectra in three regions. One is the pre-age region, then you, you have a Jens region that is uh, near the absorption age, and then you have a away from a absorption region about 1000 EV or so and this uh, around uh, 50 EV near the age that region is known as gens. So from these gens as well as excess one can get a similar kind of information in a slightly different way. So when you are doing a, a basically trying to analyze the gens so what information one can get is one can get a covalency, what is the electronic structure, oxidation, and what is the site symmetry. In case of excess, you can uh, try. Uh, you can find the uh, type of ligand, what is their distance, and how many atoms are uh, there. What is the coordination number? This is an example of genes. Uh, so, as we mentioned, uh, that we can uh, we can find out the valency of uh, the atom in the system. 
so how what happens is when there is a change in the valency the the absorption is shift towards the higher energy and based on the shift of this absorption is one can find out what will be the uh, oxidation state or valency of the uh, at a particular element in a system and why this shift is this can be understood uh, based on the coulomb effect and uh, when uh, there is a less number of electrons the, there will be a less scre screening that leads to a higher energy or one can say when we have a higher valency the bond length will be shorter and then these vacuum state are at higher energy so by the comparison itself we we can find out a uh, particular element is in which oxidation state of course when you increase the energy you will get some uh, very sharp uh, rise in the absorption co co coefficient that is known as white line and after that you will get subsequently uh, uh, oxidation the origin of the origin of white line is uh, 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 in case of system you take a condensed uh, system what happens is uh, this uh, transition to a final state according to the fermi golden rule depend upon the density of state in the final uh, state so <clears throat> in some systems the density of state empty density of state in the uh, conduction band is higher so that leads to a higher absorption when you further increase the energy the density of state is less that's why this falls so this is the origin of white peak this uh, this figure explains the various region in the x-ray absorption now let's uh, try to uh, understand what we can uh, do from a pre-age so what is the pre-age as you can see when you are doing measurement you should get an absorption only when there is a empty state and this age is corresponding to a transition when this core electron goes to a continuum but there are systems where you can have before the continuum you can have a, a basically empty 3d or 4p states uh, is available and when you increase the energy there will be a transition to this state and that leads to uh, a pre-age structure in the absorption spectra and this this also can be used to find out what will be the uh, symmetry of the system uh, symmetry of, uh, at that uh, particular atomic site how as we know that uh, dipole transition uh, the change in angular momentum is plus one but if let's say in your system uh, this uh, empty state has some hybridization because of uh, because this uh, this hybridization and uh, let's say p state and d state and when it is in a perfectly symmetric uh, condition the hybridization is not there if there is a distortion in the uh, octahedral or whatever uh, geometry we have that leads to uh, uh, hybridization and then uh, there, there, there is a possibility that one can get uh, higher uh, this transition because uh, because of uh, available empty state which which is allowed because of the dipole transition so this pre-age structure is also indicative of a, uh, you can say distortion of a, a polyhedra then uh, we have a nearest that we discussed that gives the valency information about the valency and then excess now let's come to the practical aspect so when you are doing a measurement uh, it's important that uh, if, if you are doing measurement where the, your uh, element is a measure uh, like uh, whatever element you want to study is a measure component percentage is more then it will be better to do a uh, measurement in the transmission geometry there should be enough trans, uh, transmission to get a decent signal and practically if your absorption coefficient mu times t is around 2.5 uh, 
or above the above the absorption is then the signal quality will be good another thing is your sample must be uniform and free of pin holes means uh, that uh, it should be uh, well compact so that uh, there, there won't be a deviation in the absorption intensity if your system has a porosity and which varies uh, or is not uniform then what happens is if there is a variation in the beam position that leads to a different absorption uh, transmission intensity that will give a uh, incorrect absorption coefficient or if you take a powder the grain size should not be much larger than the absorption length in this this is sometime it is possible to achieve these conditions but uh, uh, by tweaking uh, basically reducing the particle size and all uh, it, it is possible to do to get a good transmission data as i mentioned earlier if you have a, a element which is more than 10% uh, so then this uh, uh, transmission measurement method is good before going to this one we can uh, uh, before going to uh, accuracy of measurement uh, we will discuss about uh, why we uh, in which pin, uh, condition this x-ray absorption is good so when you you want the information that is uh, element is specific and local information then x-ray absorption technique can be used since this gives a uh, uh, information for the local environment it is uh, it doesn't depend upon the structure of the your uh, system like if it is a crystalline or amorphous or liquid one can get a uh, because uh, one can get a uh, local environment uh, information so uh, coming to the accuracy of measurement the uh, accuracy of xs measurement depend upon the data quality how you get a signal to noise ratio what is the accuracy of uh, energy that uh, you are measuring uh, what is the maximum k range and also there should not be any contamination from a harmonics higher harmonics when you are doing we will come to this slightly later and with this uh, excess measurement one can get a, a distance accuracy of around plus minus 0 0.01 angstrom and this value also depend upon the quality of data and also other factors like uh, what is the uh, nearby is whether you can get a higher Q range data and with this technique of course uh, this error can be of the order of 0 0.02 or more depending upon the data file if you are interested only in the coordination number then this technique can give typically uh, plus minus 20 to 25 percent accuracy and uh, atoms at ambient condition one can study uh, from this z value of 6 to 17 and one can distinguish, uh, distinguish uh, delta z plus minus 3 or so while doing the atom uh, analysis one need to limit the number of fitting, uh, fitting parameters one should get a high signal uh, signal to noise ratio and the q range would be large now coming to the measurement uh, how we can do the measurement Uh, what we require is basically the absorption of uh, x-ray with respect to the energy so either one can achieve this in, in the form of dispersive geometry or one can do a uh, scanning geometry so this is one example where let's say synchrotron x-ray which is a white x-ray that is coming now you can use a polychromator what is a polychromator basically use a uh, band crystal and depending upon the angle this band crystal uh, diffract uh, energy in a different way so if if you have a higher angle you will get a certain angle energy lambda one if you have a low angle you will get an angle uh, energy lambda two or uh, wavelength lambda two now in this case what happens is you need to calibrate such kind of system so that uh, 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 so that you can get an accurate result. So this, as I mentioned, it, it is a sort of a dispersion. So at when uh, when it passes through the sample, 
at different location the energy will be different and this energy depends upon the position in, on the detector so this position has, has to be well calibrated so this is a bit uh, difficult in the sense uh, uh, if there is a, there is a, any variation in the uh, source position that leads to the change in the angle and that leads to the change in the calibration so for uh, such kind of uh, setup it is very important that your source should be very stable so that you can get a reliable and reproducible data to uh, to get a uh, basically linear calibration what is being used is basically one uh, this polychromator should be in the form of a uh, uh, elliptical shape so that uh, the synchrotron source at one location is focused at other location and you can get a ablation free uh, spot and also the higher resolution now what you can do is if you are interested in high pressure measurement then you need to put your high pressure device at the sample location but uh, for this one the requirement is your spot size should be less than uh, the whole size otherwise it, it will be difficult to get a uh, complete spectra so this is a bit challenging it uh, because it will depend upon the source size as well if your source size is bigger it is not possible to uh, focus in a small area so that a diamond annual cell me based measurement can be done in a full energy range uh, that is around 1000 eV or so of course one can do uh, near edge absorption so there is another technique in this case what is being used is you have a synchrotron source now you scan the energy of a, a monochromator so you select only one energy and then you me measure the energy of uh, incident energy of synchrotron by ionization chamber then you put a sample and then whatever is transmitting that again is uh, detected through uh, ionization chamber in this what is being done is you change the energy record intensity i0 and i1 for a sufficient statics and then you move to the next so this is a step scan technique and that this take very long time uh, almost tens of minute or you can say sometimes it takes few hours of course in this case the beam stability also is important however it is more reliable uh, when your source is uh, uh, not stable then this this is uh, scanning type absorption uh, technique is more reliable one can also add one more uh, ionization chamber uh, so that and you can put a standard sample so that you can uh, calibrate uh, the monochromator so recently what uh, what is being done uh, basically uh, a continuous scanning axis uh, is uh, implemented at INDUS2 by Aswini uh, Kumar Postman and what uh, what is being done is in this case this geometry and synchronization of uh, monochromator ionization chamber is very important and if you synchronize you can uh, basically remove the uh, 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 you can say the background or the uh, noise so that uh, you can get this data in a very short time scale and in this case you can do take a multiple data and you can average and typically in this geometry uh, one can get a x-ray absorption spectra within a few seconds or so so this kind of geometry can be used for high pressure measurement but certainly one need to focus uh, the beam so that it uh, passes through a uh, uh, diamond angle cell and also uh, th 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 there should not be cutting because if there is a, some additive part in the I0 then there, there, this will lead to a, uh, inaccuracy in the calculation of the absorption coefficient So when we are doing a uh, high pressure measurement, let's say we want to do high pressure. So what is the challenging part? First of all, you cannot do XAS measurement for all the systems because your sample is inside a 
diamond anvil set or sample container which is used to generate uh, high pressure so that uh, that will give a absorption so it's very important how one can minimize the absorption in the diamond anvil set of course you require a small spot size and uh, because of uh, diamond you will get uh, only limited energy range which can pass through you can see the transmission so uh, only the window where you have a uh, uh, you can say uh, around about the element which has a, is about 8 kV or so uh, can be studied and if it is uh, uh, its uh, k is is much at much higher energy then the synchrotron flux is plays a role because you, if you don't have a sufficient fl uh, flux, then also one uh, won't be able to do high pressure measurement. The another important thing when doing a high pressure measurement is basically uh, diamond glitches. So what are these diamond glitches? Basically, you are passing the uh, energy through a diamond or X-ray through a diamond, and diamond is a sickle crystal. At certain energy. Uh, this diffraction condition is satisfied or you can say single crystal diffraction condition is satisfied and some part of the beam is diffracted. So that gives a spurious high uh, uh, value of absorption that you can see in this uh, spectra that there, there will be an absorption when you change the pressure that also shifts. Uh, this is the spectra which we recorded at our beam line. BL11. So, how you can overcome this uh, uh, problem of the glitch? Uh, basically, what you do is you record uh, several absorption spectra by changing uh, or by uh, changing the angle or uh, by rotating the diamond angle cell so that these glitches will come at different positions. So, you start with the zero. These are the diamond glitches because of the single crystal diamond diffraction here. Now you rotate. When you rotate is the diffraction condition will be satisfied at slightly different uh, energy and thereby you will have a, uh, you can record a several spectra with the different rotation angle and then one can write an algorithm that uh, by processing all these spectra only those data point which is the minimum of all these things is taken. So if you take the minimum of all these spectra, you can construct a, a smooth without uh, uh, diamond impurity or diamond glitches, uh, the uh, basically uh, absorption spectra. And that can be used for doing high pressure uh, X-ray absorption, X-ray access or change measurement. Now another way of doing the measurement is instead of using a single crystal diamond, if one uses a polycrystalline or a nano diamond, which is also hard but difficult to get. So in that case, there, there will be a, the background will be continuous because it is a powder. So the diffraction condition will be uh, uh, satisfied at all the condition and you will get a smooth uh, absorption. So there won't be a problem of diamond glitches. So this is a picture where you can rotate the cell and get this. Coming to the data analysis, what uh, you are measuring is basically absorption. So we are interested only the, in the uh, change in the absorption, and that is uh, the oscillation. So one can. Uh, fit a smooth background before the A's and after the A's and then you, uh, you can uh, construct a spectra which can be further uh, reduced uh, to get an oscillation which is defined as by uh, mu e minus mu zero e upon delta mu zero which is delta mu zero is this absorption jump and then one can take a suitable Fourier transform to get a, a, a radial uh, distribution and this, this spectra is then fitted with the model so that in case of excess, it is essential to have a model 
and based on the model only one uh, try to uh, do the analysis and then also it is the another important point is one need to reduce the number of pa fitting parameters so if you uh, have a knowledge a priori uh, that uh, what should be the coordination number then it would be easier then based on that one one uh, construct a model and then start fitting the parameter If you want to do a, a high pressure Jenks analysis, so what can be done is, of course, at ambient condition, this Jenks is used uh, as a fingerprinting because each element have a uh, their unique uh, uh, absorption near the edge, so that can be used. But uh, when you are doing a high pressure, so the important thing is uh, the valency. When you are increasing the pressure, the coordination of particular atom changes sometimes it is not possible to deduce this using x-ray diffraction when your uh, system is uh, or high pressure phase is not crystalline in that case uh, access gives uh, uh, basically uh, the information one can get from the access about the local environment you can sit at a particular atom and see how this uh, is environment is changing how it is different from uh, uh, from an ambient phase. One, one also uses a first principle calculation to deduce uh, uh, Jain's spectra, but that is uh, quite challenging. As I mentioned, in case of uh, uh, X-ray absorption, there is a limitation. You uh, cannot assess all the elements. Let's say if, you're, uh, if you are interested in uh, carbon and oxygen, absorption age, then it is not possible even uh, uh, for the ambient condition where the system is uh, uh, gives a signal only from a surface because its absorption age is around 500 dB or 300 dB. So, so in that case, the, this technique is very important. One can do axial Raman scattering or non-resonant inelastic axial scattering. So what is the advantage? This also gives a, a information similar to x-ray absorption and it is a bulk sensitive it, it gives us uh, information about uh, uh, bonding and valency it also gives a local structure and symmetry but the problem is this is a very weak scattering so if you uh, see out of around 10 to 4, 12 photons you have only 10 to 1000 counts in a solid angle so when uh, uh, if they, anybody wants to do X-ray Raman scattering, one requires a very high brilliance source. Uh, nowadays it is possible because of a third generation synchrotron, one can do uh, X-ray Raman scattering. But the important thing is the uh, instrumentation is also very challenging because you require a high resolution crystal analyzer and there should be a large number of crystal analyzer because your intensity uh, is very weak, your counter rate is very weak. To, to get a sufficient uh, counts, you should have a, a large number of analyzers. Let's see what is uh, X-ray Raman scattering. Your, uh, you have a photon that is coming, and then this is with the energy H cross omega, wave up to Q, then final will be KF. So there will be a uh, change in the wave vector or change in the energy and based on this one we will see uh, okay so uh, the transition probability in case in any transition is given by uh, fermi golden rules which depends upon the final density of state and when you reduce for accelerated raman scattering this double differential cross section turns out to be a uh, multiplication of two parts one is the Thomson scattering and another one is the dynamical uh, S, S of QE is the dynamical structure factor. In case of absorption, this this is this is a dipole term, and in case of Raman scattering, it is uh, in the form of exponential i iota q dot r. So when there is a small change in the momentum, you can uh, a small change in q dot r. One can uh, 
approximate this exponential with the q dot r and this gives a information similar to the x-ray absorption so for diamond anvil cell if one wants to assess the element which is not able to uh, get because of the diamond and uh, diamond absorption one can do raman uh, x-ray raman scattering which also give a similar information and the instrumentation is a bit complicated in case so in this case there are two ways you can do experiment so uh, in a low energy mode what is being done is basically you uh, you, you change the in incident energy i0 you whatever is scattered uh, x-ray photons are there that is energy analyzed using a multi channel detector so this is a sample you have a scattering x-rays and the elastic part is uh, uh, basically analyzed using this uh, crystal analyzer and as i mentioned because of low uh, intensity you require a large number of uh, these uh, detectors and this is one example where id20 in the esrf where they have used a large number of uh, crystal analyzer and detector to get a raman signal and uh, typically this, these measurements are done at around 10 kV or so and similar to uh, photon raman scattering one can subtract from a, uh, from a, you can say the elastic uh, part and then uh, one can uh, reduce the change in the energy and that gives uh, absorption spectrum so here are the two uh, examples here uh, this oxygen k is uh, is studied under high pressure so this in this study uh, what happens in pressurized co2 whether it's uh, polymerizes or it remains in the uh, molecular form that one can study using x-ray raman spectrum now coming to uh, another technique that is uh, neutron scattering and what you can do is uh, you can uh, find the structure and dynamics of the system So let's discuss about neutron scattering. What you can get is basically structure and dynamics uh, from the neutron scattering. It has an advantage as well as disadvantage. So what are the advantages? So it's a, one can get a neutron wavelength uh, similar to the order of uh, neutron spacing. Uh, since this uh, neutron has a kinetic energy, so it can be used for excitation in the sol solids. Uh, it can penetrate, uh, penetrate into the a system so one can uh, uh, study the bulk and this is a weak interaction uh, so it's it basically helps in uh, interpreting the uh, scattering data it's isotope uh, uh, sensitive so different isotope have a different contrast and since neutron also uh, has a uh, spin and uh, magnetic moment so it couples to uh, a magnetic uh, uh, moment of the atoms so it can see uh, uh, the magnetic uh, part of the system as well what is the disadvantage in generally the new, these neutron sources are very weak the signal is very weak you require very large sample this is particularly important for high pressure so it, it will be difficult to achieve high pressure and do uh, neutron deflection in in this case some of the elements are uh, very uh, much absorbing so you one cannot do a, a neutron measurement on cadmium, boron, and gadolinium, and uh, there are some materials which have a, uh, almost zero scattering depth. They also cannot be studied, but they can be used as a sample con container. And there is a that we, since we are we will be work, uh, discussing only the structural part, we won't be discussing this. So the, we will start how these uh, neutron interact uh, with the system. So uh, 
there are two mechanisms by which it can interact there is a nuclear interaction and uh, if it is a elastic scattering one can deduce uh, or one can, it, it gives the information of the crystal structure if it is an inelastic scattering then uh, one can get information about the that is dynamics as i mentioned it has a magnetic uh, um, moment also so one can do uh, magnetic scattering uh, again if it is a magnetic elastic scattering then it gives the magnetic structure in the system if it is an elastic scattering then one can get a, uh, information about the magnetic uh, excitation and uh, if you compare with the x-ray uh, the important thing is uh, in case of X-ray, there is a systematic variation in the interaction of X-ray with the shared value. So it, it is not possible to distinguish a nearby atom. And uh, particularly, it, it will be difficult to get the information for low Z element using X-ray. Uh, of course, one can use uh, nowadays a powerful first principle technique to find out the uh, position of this uh, light element when you have uh, information of a uh, uh, ij element uh, through x-ray diffraction but uh, if uh, one wants to uh, deduce the information from the experiment that neutron technique is important if uh, one wants to know what will be the uh, isotopic effect then one can do because the scattering cross section for the different isotope or uh, is very different and it, it also uh, it also is a non monotonous or you can say it is random for uh, if you see the scattering cross section with the atomic number and since its interaction is uh, weak so one can to have a large penetration depth so typically what is being done in a neutron scattering is you have an incident uh, radiation or that is a neutron if you consider a wave because of wave particle duality it has a wave vector ki energy ei and after the scattering if at particular angle we get a uh, final energy is ef and uh, wave vector is kf so there will be a momentum or uh, transfer that is q is Kf minus Ki or energy transfer delta E. Now, depending upon the uh, what will be the energy change, it can be uh, elastic scattering or inelastic scattering. We will see only the elastic scattering where the magnitude of uh, momentum vector uh, remain constant, and the, the basically that means that there is a no change in the energy. And if uh, one see what will be the its uh, differential. Uh, uh, cross section when you uh, you do a scattering from a crystalline system then uh, there will be a different part in this uh, differential scattering cross section you have a nuclear structure factor and then this is a delta function which is satisfied uh, when, whenever there is a break condition so uh, whenever this momentum transfer uh, satisfy the bread condition you will get the uh, peak but the intensity of peak depend upon the nu uh, nuclear structure factor and if you see the nuclear structure factor this is uh, this this is the form of a nuclear structure factor where this B is a uh, nuclear scattering which is analogous to uh, atomic uh, scattering factor and this is a constant so what does it mean is basically uh, it, it doesn't depend upon the Q. So when you do the neutron diffraction, there won't be any uh, change in the uh, intensity if you if you uh, you record at the up to very high Q value or so. But uh, in, in case of X-ray, because of uh, atomic form factor, which is nothing but the Fourier transform of uh, uh, atom, then uh, this, this decays very rapidly uh, as we know uh, that for uh, short range these uh, uh, for the short range uh, the, these nuclear force are short range and one can define this potential in the form of uh, 
uh, delta function and the some scattering length which which is related to the differential uh, cross section and uh, the total cross section is nothing but uh, 4 pi p square so what uh, the as we mentioned what can do is uh, using the neutron diffraction one can study the crystalline solid liquids and amorphous materials uh, in case of x-ray also it is possible to uh, study the liquid as well as uh, amorphous material if one do a total x-ray diffraction uh, study that uh, we have not covered and in, in in case of neutron reflection depending upon the uh, kind of uh, length scale we are interested in one can probe uh, different uh, uh, structure like crystalline structure or uh, microscopic or mesoscopic structure can be studied in case of uh, neutron scattering or uh, the there is a basically this interaction cross section has a two part one is the coherent and another one is the incoherent so what is the coherent part basically when uh, whenever there is a scattering of a neutron from a different nuclei if they are coherent then that will contribute to uh, diffraction if they are not coherent means they are not in phase then that will contribute to a uh, uh, background because uh, the, their scattering will be uh, isotropic and what is the origin of this one is basically uh, it, it, it depends upon how this neutron interact with the uh, nucleus. So the spin part, if it is uh, because it has a spin, nucleus also has a spin, the, the, the spin part of the interaction is not coherent because two uh, nuclei are not, uh, two nuclei spin is not uh, correlated because of uh, distance and there is no interaction between these nuclei so that lead to the incoherent part and that contributes to the background so that's why in case of neutron uh, we have to see uh, that uh, coherent if we are interested in the diffraction then coherent scattering cross section should be more so that's why mostly uh, the this uh, hydrogenous system is uh, replaced with the neutron so that one can get a high contrast So what are the possible neutron source? You can have a nuclear reactor where you get a, a neutron from a fission reaction. And uh, in case of reactor, you have a neutron which is thermalized and you would get a max, Maxwellian profile. And out of this uh, uh, Maxwellian profile, one can select particular uh, energy of this uh, neutron for uh, experiment if one wants to do a monochromatic uh, diffraction experiment and depending upon the width one can uh, increase the flux of course with the comp uh, compromise in the energy resolution. The another neutron source is a stellation neutron source which is uh, in the form of pulse, pulse source we will discuss later. So here is the neutron scattering facility uh, at uh, BARC. So this is a typical picture of a neutron diffraction, uh, diffractometer. So there is a reactor. From the reactor, uh, the, again, there is a biological sealing wall. So these uh, neutrons are tapped from inside the reactor. Then these, uh, because this is in the form of uh, uh, Maxwell distribution, you will need to select particular energy. So one uses a monochromator. One can use silicon, germanium, and various kind of monochromators are used. Then you put a sample, and when depending upon the uh, scattering, uh, it is similar to the angle dispersive uh, X ray diffraction. So, with the you record a signal with a different angle, so you get a, a intensity pa pattern with respect to the 2 theta. The, uh, the another source is a stellation neutron source. In case of uh, fission-based reactor source, the neutron flux is continuous, but in case of uh, stellation source, it is uh, in the form of pulse. And how these neutrons are being generated is basically you start with the 
hydrogen minus ion then you accelerate those ion to a intermediate energy then you further accelerate this ion to a high energy and then you uh, accumulate in a ring so that you can uh, reduce its uh, uh, width or you and uh, and once this uh, energy is increases about one cv or so they are uh, uh, they they are made to fall on a high z element target and which uh, in a in a particular one reaction emits around 20 to 13 neutrons of high energy and which are further because these are of uh, high energy and for the neutron diffraction measurement one need to uh, pull these uh, uh, neutron or to uh, match the uh, wavelength of this neutron uh, similar to the crystalline system and one uses uh, moderator uh, either water or uh, liquid helium also and in this case uh, one can take advantage of uh, different experimental technique like uh, in the earlier slide we saw that this is similar to uh, uh, angle dispersive diffraction so you have a continuous store you are selecting uh, only a small portion of this one for doing the measurement in case of spallation neutron source, one can take advantage of a pulse nature of uh, uh, this uh, source and one can do a time of flight measurement where you utilize all the neutron for uh, a diffraction measurement and one can uh, construct a large uh, detector bank, bank so that one can do a measurement and uh, small time scale with a higher signal to noise ratio. Coming to the high pressure, as we mentioned, for high pressure, in case of neutron, you require a very uh, large amount of the sample because its scattering cross section is very less and it, it is not easy to uh, achieve higher pressure for a higher volume. Uh, so, uh, people have uh, developed various kind of uh, high pressure cell which, uh, which can go to a higher pressure uh, at the same time higher volume. So one of the cell is uh, Paris Edinburgh, which can be used. And in this case, one can use uh, a time of flight measurement or uh, one can use the normal uh, angle dispersive in such a way that, so that, uh, so how it can be done is one uses a gasket material, which is uh, uh, whose uh, neutron scattering uh, length can be made zero. But still, uh, when you do the measurement under high pressure, there will be a large background from the sample, and that sample amount is also very less. So these are uh, quite demanding, and one cannot go to a very high pressure like diamond angle cell. One can go to uh, several megabar or so. In this case, this uh, Paris Edinburgh cell, one can study up to 40 gigapascal or so. There are various uh, designs where people have uh, optimized uh, uh, the uh, basically toroidal cell so that one can have a single, double, and various dimensions and one can get a uh, high pressure measurement on this. Uh, there is a recent development uh, on a diamond and cell, one can see, and with this uh, one can uh, basically compress a slightly higher volume which is almost 100 times the uh, volume of a conventional diamond and will say and uh, one can do a measurement up to hundreds of uh, gpa and this is an example uh, where the ice has been studied using uh, the new this kind of uh, diamond and will say up to around 100 gpa so I, ice equation of state is reduced up to 100 gpa using a uh, neutron diffraction measurement. There are other various kind of cell which can be used which has a uh, low neutron absorption but these cells work at uh, uh, low pressure only and when this parasite inverse cell can also be used at a uh, lower temperature. I think we will stop here. Thank you very much. If there is any question I will be happy to answer.
if there is any question in the YouTube. Now participant can unmute themselves and ask the question. Yes, sir. I just add a minor clarification to when dealing with the X-ray methods. You made a couple of time statements. X-rays cannot differentiate between neighboring atoms. People should interpret when you mean neighboring. You mean neighboring atoms in periodic periodic table. Z Z value. Yes. Yeah, it, it is not a neighboring in the crystalline. Yes. There's no questions, we can stop. Huh? Yes. Question. 